friends, welcome to this pre-recorded worship from Plymouth Congregational Church in Minneapolis. I'm Beth Hoffman Faith, Minister for Congregational Care and Worship here at Plymouth, and I am delighted to welcome you into this time of worship together. I know that you may be watching at any time of day from a variety of places, and I'm grateful that our community expands and extends in a time when we need to be distanced, scattered, yet gathered, basking in the reminders of God's promises to us and in the love and solidarity of a spiritual community. So welcome. It is summer, my friends. It is summer. I had someone say to me this week that it just does not feel like summer because of the weight and worry of the world, because of the precautions we are still uh, under and practicing. For many, it doesn't feel like the lazy, hazy days of summer. It's not what we are used to. But I hope in these days in the beautiful sun, in the glorious sky, as our gardens begin to blossom and our vegetables begin to bear fruit, I pray that you will find time to enjoy these summer days and to know that even though things feel different, there are ways that we can be reminded of the many blessings in our midst. I don't have many announcements this morning. I will once again remind you that while we are moving through this time of pandemic and we are not gathering in person on Sunday mornings, we are grateful for your enduring and consistent financial support of the ministries of the church. Our food shelf continues to serve hundreds of people. Our school in the in the building is open. We are serving the community a hot meal every Sunday evening, and your help is needed to make these things and more happen. If you stay tuned, you will know of more virtual and small group gatherings that will begin to occur as we move into fall. And so we are grateful for your financial support, and you will see on your screen a way to easily text your gift, or you can visit our website or mail in your pledge or tithe and know how thankful we are. Over the last few weeks, those of us who occasionally come to the building have enjoyed seeing some of our children here during peace camp. Great thanks to Nina Johnson and to Dylan Church for facilitating this multi-week safely practiced and distanced event for the children of the church and community. And so today, our children present to us our peace candle. And we are grateful for the reminders of the blessings they bring to our life and to uh, the world and how much each little life is so precious to God. The past three weeks, the children of Plymouth Church have been participating in peace camp. The theme of this year's peace camp is compassion. We have learned about compassion for ourselves, for our families, for our community, and for the world. This week, our children each got to pick what they would light the peace candle in honor of, and that is what we will share with you now. This week, the peace campers are lighting the peace candle. We are lighting it in honor of for the loved ones we've lost, for brave, for the brave nurses and doctors, treats for everyone, for Brianna Taylor, a clean environment, for all the people who've lost their jobs, for all the animals, For justice, but not for me, everyone. 
for family. Poor George Floyd. beautiful children at peace camp and around the world amen The reading for today is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from them into a boat to his deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard this, they followed him from the towns on foot. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them, and he cured their sick. When it was evening, his disciples said to him, This is a deserted place. The hour is very late. Send the crowds home so that they might go into the towns to get some food and feed themselves. And he said, They don't need to go away. You can give them something to eat. And they said, but all we have are five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them to me. And then he asked the crowd to sit down on the grass. He took the loaves and the fish. He looked to heaven. He blessed. He broke the loaves gave them to him, and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave the food to the people, and everybody ate, and all were filled. And afterwards, they picked up all the broken bits and pieces and filled twelve baskets. And those that ate that day were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Here ends the reading.
Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Quaker author Parker Palmer tells about an unusual experience he had while flying. He writes, after a speech in Saskatoon, I boarded a 6 a.m. flight home to Wisconsin. Our departure was delayed because the truck that brings coffee to the planes had broken down. After a while, the pilot said, we're going to take off without the coffee. We want to get you to Detroit on time. I was up front where all the road warriors sat, a surly tribe, especially at that early hour. They began griping loudly and at length about the incompetence, the lousy service, and so forth. Once we got into the air, the lead flight attendant came to the center of the aisle with her mic and said, I know you're upset about the coffee. And then there was this dramatic pause. Well, get over it. Start sharing your stuff with your seatmates. That bag of peanuts you got on your last flight and put in your pocket, tear it open and pass them around. If you've got gum or mints, mints share them. You can't read all the sections of the paper at once. Offer them to each other. Show off the pictures of your kids and grandkids that you have in your wallets. And she went on in that vein, and people began laughing and doing what she told them to do. A surly scene turned into summer camp. An hour later, the attendant passed by Parker's seat, and he signaled to her. What you did was amazing, he said. Where can I send a letter of commendation? Thanks, she said. I'll get you the form. And then she leaned down and whispered, the loaves and fishes are real. Of course, during a pandemic, that kind of sharing would not be welcomed, but we do remember those days. Of all the stories in the Bible, the story of the loaves and fishes is certainly a familiar one to many of us. So familiar that I think we think we know the lessons. There are various interpretations, and they include it's a miracle story about Jesus' divinity, or it's a metaphor about sharing and generosity, or, and this may be the least familiar, it's a temptation story inviting Jesus to lead a military coup. So which is it? Miracle, metaphor, or military might? That's the title of this sermon. If we call it a miracle, then we get to embrace this God who defies our understanding and goes beyond our human limits. We worship a God who makes a way out of no way, and that can be deeply comforting. We also get to embrace the narrative that all miracle stories tell, which is that God is a God who provides, who never runs out of sustenance, freedom, health, or hospitality and who shares all these willingly, even lavishly, with us. There's a reason there are 12 baskets left after everyone has had their fill. The message is that God never runs out and always has more than enough. This is a great message, but the magical thinking sometimes goes against our modern sensibilities. We don't necessarily need a miracle to think about God as ineffable. If we understand the story as metaphorical, we don't have to wrestle with whether we believe in these science-defying supernatural feats. It simply means that if we share what we have, it is enough for everyone. In fact, more than enough. Pope Francis has gotten some flack for how he's talked about the feeding of the 5,000 or the loaves and fishes. He called it a parable and said, the parable of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes teaches us exactly this, that if there is a will, what we have never ends. On the contrary, it abounds and does not get wasted. Sharing our resources and generosity is a great lesson for how we ought to treat each other. But here is what Episcopalian priest Martin Smith asks. 
Why did 5,000 able-bodied males converge on Jesus when he had sailed over the Sea of Tiberias with the Twelve into an uninhabited hill country? Smith then invites us to imagine what this would have looked like to Roman intelligence officers. Smith writes, They would have been very aware that the feast of the Passover was near, in which Jews celebrated their liberation from Egyptian oppressors. Jewish insurgents often launched their rebellions just before Passover when feelings were running high, especially high, about the shame and misery of being under Roman occupation. And then secondly, the gathering was in the wilderness, which as we know from the Jewish historian Josephus, was the traditional mustering place for rebels out of the range of military surveillance. Smith continues that they would have seen these 5,000 men not just milling about, but according to the same story in the Gospel of Mark, drawn up in strict formation, groups of 50 and 100. This was a militia of 5,000 able-bodied males assembling in platoons. Every gospel story tells this story of the feeding of the 5,000, but we get a new perspective from the gospel of John's concluding verse. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This was an attempt to muster an insurgent rebel force and to compel Jesus to assume military leadership. Smith points out the feeding of the the story of the feeding of the 5000 men is at heart a temptation story. The men want Jesus to assume authoritative rule, to seize power over as opposed to power with, to resort to time-tested methods of political gain like slaughter, plunder, and other violent tactics as the most efficient way to bring about God's reign of justice and peace on earth. What these different versions of the story cover up is the deeper collective sense of fear and powerlessness. They wanted Jesus to take their problems and solve them because they were at their wit's end and they didn't know what to do. How often do we long for someone to tell us what to do so we don't have to feel so powerless in the face of staggering need within our community and the world. But Jesus doesn't fall into the trap. He doesn't want to be their king. He doesn't want to tell them what to do. Instead, he wants to figure it out with them. He knows that they are hungry not only for the bread of physical nourishment, but also for the bread of solidarity, the bread of possibility, the bread of feeling that no matter how hungry any one of us is, none of us will be satisfied until we all have a piece of it together. Jesus is saying we all get hungry, and in doing so, he turns the dynamics of power and powerlessness of fear and courage, of victor and rescuer on its head. It's not just about having enough food, but also about the hunger we all feel for the, for power, to make, for the power to make a difference, to have right and just relationships. When we start to despair in our own powerlessness, or worse, become ap- apathetic, towards social needs, or when we start pointing fingers at others whose problems it is to solve, we ignore our own appetites and our own responsibility to be partners in change. Ultimately, this story of the feeding of the 5,000 changes the script from one of of expected and forceful domination to effective and thoughtful collaboration. In the face of all these men, Jesus turns to a little child. In the face of all this male bravado wanting to charge the mountain, Jesus says, have a seat on the grass. He does this in order to build a new kind of power, not just with men, but with children and women as well. 
He wants to build power with the hungry, not for the hungry, which means that we all need to recognize a hunger within ourselves. What's more, he wants us building power with God, and he ultimately wants us to learn to trust. As Smith says, that our world, God's world, has more than enough. It has thrilling superabundance on the condition that we cooperate by changing the agenda from overpowering to feeding. And acting in trust creates an amazing quantity of leftover. Imagine trusting in our shared hunger that we all have an equal place at the table and that we all have gifts to bring, all genders, all colors of skin, homeless and housed, hungry and well-fed, Imagine acting with trust in our capacity for all of us to give and share what we have, whether food or money or time or talent. Imagine loving each other enough that we stop the violence. Maybe the question for those of us who are well-fed is this. What do we hunger for? And what will truly satisfy us in the face of our own powerlessness? Until we can get a better sense of what acting in solidarity is all about. Until we can know what it means to act with and not for others. To speak with and not for others. Maybe we need to slow down and be silent and listen. Whether or not Jesus molecularly multiplied the bread and the fish like an amazing miracle, or if the crowds managed to open up their baskets and share with their neighbors, this story opens up the possibility that change can happen, not by force, but by looking within and looking around. Not by looking for a savior, but realizing there's more available to us than we realize. It's a familiar quote from Margaret Mead, where she states, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Let's be a part of that small, thoughtful, committed group of citizens called the church. Maybe the disciples like us needed to be reminded that even when we think we do not have what is needed, what is needed is still at hand. It will come from God. It will come from our neighbors. It will come from those least expected. Because in God's economy, that's how it works. What you have is enough because it is never all there is. God is extravagant. We get to witness the love of God every time we come up short, and yet things get done. Take courage, my friends. Trust in God and do your part. Pray, march, sew masks, volunteer, call people on the telephone, canvas, and vote. For we do have what we need to get through this time in our story. May it be so. Amen.
I invite you into a time of prayer. Spirit of life, giver of grace, fall afresh on us. With every breath, our hearts rend with concern for people and places near and far. In spoken word and silent plea, we lift our prayers to you, O God. Each day we are reminded of the tragedy that is this pandemic. So many deaths, so many ills, the numbers stagger. Even while we debate the best course for moving forward, for resuming schools, for wearing masks, for recovering the economy, for seeking financial restitution, people are dying. Lives are being destroyed. There is so much suffering. We tend to the grief of our own losses, but the larger picture is too big to bear, Holy One. Help us differentiate between minor inconvenience and major life alteration. While we pray for our own patience, we ask for your balm to comfort the myriad of folks who are grieving in the wake of the power of this virus. We have borne witness, O oh God, to the possibility of transformation rising from the ashes of despair. Continue to guide us, even in the midst of a global pandemic, on the path of racial justice. When bodies, hearts, and minds unite for change, it can happen, even when the road is too long and the course uncertain. Help us to remember that we already have what we need to accomplish our goal. May we embrace the legacy of so many like John Lewis, whose words of presence remind us of our continuing mission. When we see something that is not right, not fair, not just, may we say something, do something, even risking some necessary good trouble along the way. Keep our hearts ablaze for justice, O oh God, so our black and brown kindred can be embraced by the reality of your promises. We pray for those with whom we share our lives, family, friends, neighbors, who are struggling this day, those who are unemployed, those grappling with illness, those in despair from broken relationships, those grieving a death, those living with mental illness, those caught in the web of addiction, so many hanging on by a precarious thread, living in the midst of predicaments for which there seems no obvious answer. Hear us, loving God, as we lift up to you those for whom we pray this day. We pray with bold longing for ourselves. You, O Holy One, know our need, that which batters our spirit and keeps us from being able to fully love and be loved. Shape our thoughts, sift our feelings, supervise our efforts, bless our abilities, that we may work towards reconciliation and restoration in our own lives, so we might also be a force for transformation in a world that so desperately needs our compassion and our courage. Empower us to make meaning out of each moment and to give the best to those around us. 
Sustain us with the resilience we need for this time when all seems so precarious. Certain our hearts with the constancy of your love. We trust, Spirit of life, giver of grace, that through you the broken might mend, the hungry be fed, the gaps might be bridged, the despairing might know comfort, the restless heart might find home. Fall afresh on us. Amen. Hear these words of benediction. Go into your week knowing you are forgiven and loved perfectly, knowing that you have all you need and are empowered to share God's love with everyone you meet. Go in peace. Amen. (laughs) 